Hi, and welcome to the Archimedes stage, the home of network security and free software. And up next, we have Eben Upton, who's the founder and executive director of Raspberry Pi Foundation. And he'll be talking about his experience using Raspberry Pi and what work they're doing with open source community. So a round of applause for Eben Upton. Hey guys. Um, so yeah, my, my name's Eben Upton. Uh, I run a thing called the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, we're based in Cambridge in the UK, and we make a little computer. How many of you have Raspberry Pis? Oh, well, that's excellent. I, I, I guess I can go now, then. Um, the, um, that's kind of awesome. It's kind of awesome to see that many people with Raspberry Pis. It isn't that long. It's maybe 18 months now since, uh, since we launched. Uh, and a couple of months before that, I had a spreadsheet. Um, there were so few Raspberry Pis in the world that I had a spreadsheet that told me where every Raspberry Pi in the world is. Now, so being able to go somewhere like this and meet a bunch of new people I've never seen before and they have Raspberry Pis is still a fantastic experience for me. So um, for me, Raspberry Pi, I guess, has been a, uh, it's been about a seven year journey. This is something that happened, started for us back in Cambridge in about 2006, um, when a group of us at the university started to get a little bit concerned that um, the number of people, the, the number of people applying to study computer science at the University of Cambridge. I mean, the University of Cambridge has a very, very long tradition of doing computer science. We've been doing computer science since before there were computers. Um, we believe, along with probably another 20 universities in the world, that we were the first university to build a computer. Um, our claim to fame is that in Cambridge, we built the first computer that was used by somebody other than the people who built it, a machine called EDZAC back in the late 1940s. So we have a very long tradition in Cambridge of building computers and a very long tradition of doing computer science. And in the mid-1990s when I went to Cambridge, um, it, was in, it was an extremely hard place to get into. Uh, Cambridge is an extremely hard place to get into. Um, we had something like 500 applicants for 80 or 90 places on our computer science course. Um, and pretty much all of those people applying had managed to pick up a substantial amount of experience um, using computers. The, we had 18-year-olds who would walk in the door uh, having been programmers for 10 years, people who had had computers in their bedrooms that they'd been able to learn to program on. Um, and in fact, the, the, the problem we had as a university was the first thing you have to do with people like that is you have to convince them that they don't know everything. I mean, fortunately, we had a lot of useful tools. Uh, we had a lot of useful tools like, like Haskell, that um, if, you, uh, if someone comes in the door knowing four different kinds of assembly language at the age of 18, all you have to do is hit them in the head with Haskell for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then when they're crying on the floor, they might be prepared to accept that maybe uh, you might have something you want to teach them. So. Um, so this was a wonderful environment for us at the university. It was the environment that I went through as an undergraduate. Um, but by the time I was involved in, uh, in interviewing people to be prospective undergraduates, maybe 10 years later, um, we had the problem that our, our applicant numbers had roughly halved. And the sorts of things that people knew how to do when they came in the door had changed from people who'd been hacking on their Amigas in 68,000 assembly language um, to maybe people who'd done a little, bit of, a little bit of web design, maybe a little bit of PHP if we were really lucky. And these were, still in, these were still awesomely intelligent people. But what we found ourselves having to do increasingly was to spend more and more of our precious time at university, the precious three years that we have to turn somebody from a high school, uh, from a high school student into somebody who can start a PHP program, we had to spend more and more and more of that time teaching teaching people the sorts of basic computing skills, the sort of basic practical computer programming skills that we'd been able to rely on barely 10 years before. So a group of us at the university decided we wanted to do something about this. Um, we came up with the idea, and I mean, this is still a hypothesis for us. We came up with the idea that what had changed between the mid-90s and the mid-2000s was the availability of cheap programmable hardware. Obviously, in those 10 years, computers have become massively more powerful. But the other thing they've become is they've become mass massively more closed, or at least um, the barriers to entry, the, um, the, the often fairly inconsequential barriers to taking your computing device uh, and actually learn and being more than a passive consumer of content on that device um, had become much more severe. So a group of us sat down and we asked ourselves whether it would be possible to build a device, to build a device which we could, which we could put into children's bedrooms, a device which could be cheap enough, powerful enough, programmable enough, interesting enough, um, that it could maybe start to reverse some of that, uh, some of that decline, that we could, um, that we could start to, uh, to get people programming again as children, that we could start to get 10-year-olds programming again, and maybe after a few years of that, we'd start to see some more 18-year-olds. So um, that was back in about 2006. Um, 
we incorporated a, uh, a charity in Cambridge called the Raspberry Pi Foundation in 2008 to try and pursue this idea of building an affordable programmable computer for children. Um, by about 2010, uh, we had some working prototypes. Um, and we were really trundling along, we were bumbling along, trying to, uh, trying to solve this little local problem for Cambridge. We really thought we were trying to build something which was going to appeal to maybe a thousand people. Uh, we, th we thought we were going to build a thousand of these maybe, and we were going to give them to people. Our, our, our plan was we were going to give these to people who came for open days at the university maybe in June. Uh, and then when they arrived for an interview in December, we would be able to ask them, what did you do with that free computer that we gave you six months ago? And the people who say nothing, we probably don't want to admit them to read computer science at the University of Cambridge, right? So it was just this very simple idea of giving young people a platform that they could, giving our target group of young people a platform they could use to program on and giving them a, um, uh, and giving us an opportunity um, to screen, giving us an opportunity to do a better job in our interview process of screening out the people who really had something about themselves, people who were really interested in programming. Um, when I was a child, I had a machine called a BBC Micro. How many of you are from the UK? Uh, OK, so a good number of you. And how many of you have come across the BBC Microcomputer, yeah? So the BBC Microcomputer was this most peculiar thing for people not familiar with it. The BBC Microcomputer was a very strange thing. It was, it was a quasi-state endorsed educational microcomputer about 30 years ago. So at the start of the 1980s, the, uh, the government woke up to the fact that there was a microcomputer revolution going on. Um, and it developed an ambition that it was going to help not just children, help certainly children, but also help adults who are interested in changing career to learn a little bit more about computing. And they commissioned the British Broadcasting Corporation to produce a series of television programs uh, talking about um, delivering, micro delivering computer education. Um, and they decided they were going to endorse a machine to go along with these, um, uh, to go along with this, uh, with this series of television programs. And that machine was the BBC Microcomputer. It was built by a company in Cambridge called Acorn, who later on went on to become ARM. They eventually, you know, their lasting legacy in the world is that they now uh, produce more microprocessor cores. Their successor company, ARM, now produces more microprocessor cores than anyone else in the world. So back in the uh, early 1980s, Acorn produced this BBC Micro. And about eight years later, when I was 12, I bought my own second-hand BBC Micro. There were BBC Micros in all schools in the UK. And I'd, got, I'd learned to program. I'd started to learn to program at school on the BBC Micro. And so the, first, the, nat the machine I naturally turned to when I wanted to buy a computer for my home was a BBC Micro computer. So at the foundation, we were kind of... Um, in the early days, we were kind of um, romantic and nostalgic. And we thought it would be absolutely fantastic. We had this lovely piece of hardware. We had a piece of hardware that we were convinced uh, was going to meet our requirements. It was cheap enough, and it was fun enough, and it was programmable enough to meet our requirements. And we thought the only thing that's really missing is a brand. You know, we thought we would love, as many of us are children of the BBC Micro, we thought we would love to stick the BBC brand on our microcomputer. And so we kept going to the BBC and we kept having these meetings with the BBC and saying, hey, look, you know, we've got this computer, you've got a brand, you've got a history of using this brand with uh, educational computers, why don't you stick it on our computer? Um, and the answer was always no. And the reason the answer is no, I believe, is that um, the BBC is a state-funded entity, right? The BBC is not supposed European Union law, the BBC is not supposed to pitch up in a new market like computers. They get into enough trouble when they make magazines. They're not really supposed to pitch up in the computer market and start competing in the computer market. It's, it's, it's not allowed. And we kept trying a lot of people. And really, our last shot was we went to see a guy called Roy Kethlin Jones, who's a senior technology correspondent at the BBC. Um, and we asked him, we uh, went down to see him in May of 2011, so barely two years ago. We went down to see him, and we said, uh, we took a, took a very early prototype with us. And we said, you know, look at this. Um, do you think you can stick the BBC brand on this? And he said, no. But then he said something else. He said, do you mind if I take a video of you holding this up? Uh, and he took a video of one of my colleagues at the foundation holding up our very, very primitive little prototype and just talking for 45 seconds um, about what this um, about what this what this what we were hoping this machine could do. And we got 600,000 YouTube views in two days. Um, and those were a wonderful two days. Because I just sat at work. I, I worked for, and I still work for a company called Broadcom, um, who make um, make semiconductors. And I just sat there at my desk at Broadcom, pressing F5 um, all day for two days, and um, and watching my popularity count to count up to 600,000. Um, and I went home and I sat down with my wife at the end of the second day, and um, I was feeling really buzzed. 
and we sat down across the, uh, the dinner table from each other, and we had that kind of oh shit moment where we realized that we'd promised 600,000 people that we were going to build them a $25 computer, because we'd settled on this price of $25 very early on before we knew what we were building. We had told 600,000 people that we were going to build them a, um, a $25 computer. So I had a really fun 2011. Uh, trying to make that true. I had a, a really fun 2011, 2011 uh, trying not to be a liar. Um, we launched on the 29th of February last year. Um, we, um, we had a bit of a shock in terms of the number of people who were interested. Sold 100,000 Raspberry Pis on the first day, um, which was a great day. Um, obviously, the problem with the 29th of February is we didn't have much of a first anniversary party. Um, we're going to have a really, really good fourth anniversary party. Um, but um, we sold 100,000 on the first day. We rationed people, I'm sure many of you. How many of you had to wait a long time for your Raspberry Pi last year? I am really sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's what happens if you think you're going to build 1,000 or something and then 100,000 people order it. Um, the, so we had, a, we had a really... Uh, we had a really, we'd had a really interesting 2011 trying to make the Raspberry Pi and trying to make it at, at the right price. We had a really interesting 2012 uh, trying to make enough Raspberry Pis so that people weren't waiting six months for them. Um, finally, this year, you can actually buy a Raspberry Pi today and get it delivered tomorrow. Um, uh, and the wonderful thing is, for a lot of last year, what we were seeing was we were seeing largely people like you, largely you know, adult, technically literate adults buying Raspberry Pis. So that's absolutely fantastic. And that's a group of people that we hadn't, I think that's where our volume surprise came from. That's maybe a group of people who we, um, who we hadn't expected to be appealing to. Um, but what it did mean was they're all going to these technically illiterate adults. We had this idea that we were going to end up having to kind of flood fill the world of adults who know about computers before we get a single one into, our, into the hands of a child. And the wonderful thing about this year, the wonderful thing about 2013 is we finally had enough um, that uh, we, that we've actually been able to, we've started to see these going to the hands of children. So we've started to see the, just the first glimmer, just the first hint, and it's going to be, I think, years before we know whether our hypothesis is correct. It's going to be years before we know whether simply providing people with a cheap programmable computer they can have in their bedrooms will start, will, will go any, any way towards solving our problems. But we are starting to see the first glimmers of um, interest from children. We're starting to see people send us pictures of their children. People send us pictures of their five-year-old kids learning to program in Scratch on the Raspberry Pi. You know, kids send in their, you know, their, their third and second, third, fourth grade projects that they've done with the Raspberry Pi. And that's really, really encouraging for us. So, um, you know, really for us at the foundation, the hope is that, you know, certainly this next year, in the UK, we're very lucky to be, we're, we're, we're lucky to be doing it at th this time in the UK because there is a growing awareness from government that we do really have a problem in this country, that we're not producing enough computer programmers, that we're not producing enough scientists, that we're not producing enough engineers. So what we're, and, and from 2014, we are going to have a new computing syllabus, no longer an ICT syllabus, but a new computing syllabus in the UK, which will focus to a very great degree on programming. So what we hope in the run-up to that is that we can start to produce the material that will help everyone get more value out of the pie, not just perhaps as it is at the moment, children who are lucky enough to have a technically illiterate adult in their family or in their school. So um, I don't like to do death by PowerPoint, but it's getting very, very hard. It's getting hard for me now to resist just sharing a few of the things, a few of the cool things that we've seen people do with the Raspberry Pi. So I'm just going to hammer through this nice and quickly. And I have a few videos to show you. Uh, yeah, see how this is going to work. Beer. OK, um, so these are, these are projects. These are projects. It turns out there's a large overlap between people who are interested in computers and people who are interested in beer. That was a, that was a fantastic discovery for us. Um, turns out quite a lot of people, if you uh, uh, give them a $25 computer, the first thing they think is, how can I use this uh, $25 computer to get beer? Um, there's, a, um, there's a system called BrewPi, which was developed fairly early on, which uses the Raspberry Pi along with an Arduino to provide you with control of everything from your little um, area cupboard home, uh, home brew kit all the way up to a respectable size microbrewery. And this is an example of that. Uh, that's the point. Can't really expect that to work, can I? You can tell I've spent most of the last year running a business and not using a computer if I thought that was going to work. Uh, click. There we are. Um, and here's an example of the wonderfully named kegger face uh, that you can use to uh, control your uh, control your, your brewery from your Raspberry Pi. 
Um, we can't drink beer all the time. Sometimes we have to drink coffee. Um, a lot of the uses of Raspberry Pi that we hadn't anticipated are these kind of automation uses. These are people like us, you know, adults who already know about computers, using the Raspberry Pi as a cheap way of automating something in the world. Um, this is a coffee machine, which was, this is in our office in Cambridge. This coffee machine was mailed to us um, from the, uh, by a firm in the US who'd, who've arranged that, um, uh, who've arranged that every time you text a particular number, this thing's plumbed into SMS. Every time you, uh, you text a particular number, it uh, makes you a coffee. It doesn't check to see whether there's a mug under the coffee machine, though. So uh, uh, that's caused a few issues. Um, it's also kind of annoying for the guy in the office who we've associated it with, because people he just keeps receiving these one-word uh, uh, one SMSs that just say coffee. Um, Retro games. So one of the things that we thought when we were developing the Pi, one of the things that was important to us, is we had to remember that um, when I bought my machine, when I bought my, uh, OK, I bought my machine to program on. But when most people bought their, their computers back in the 1980s, they weren't necessarily buying them in order to program on. They were buying them for some other reason. They were buying them because they were interesting machines. They just happened to have this property that they were programmable. So when we were designing the Pi, we tried very hard to choose components which would make it interesting. And one of the, um, you know, these kind of hooks that will get the Pi into a child's life in the hope that once it's in their life, if it's in their life and it's chock full of programming tools, you know, maybe they'll think about doing some programming. One of the things we did with the, with the Pi, the SOC choice, um, we picked an SOC, an ARM-based SOC, which had a very large amount of multimedia performance. We wanted to have a device that you could have in your room and play games on. We wanted to have a device you could have in your room and play videos on. So what we've ended up with, by chance, is a device that people use for doing a lot of retro gaming. It's also a device that people use for a lot of uh, people run Xbox Media Center on. You know, we never imagined that there was going to be a genuine um, consumer application for the Pi. Um, I believe after the PC, we're the largest. We've we've overtaken jailbroken. Uh, we've overtaken jailbroken Apple TVs as the largest non-PC Xbox Media Center platform. And that was a real surprise to us. Um, retro computers, it's powerful enough to emulate a lot of computers. This is a Mac, um, uh, and it is really really that big. This this was from last week. Um, so that's effectively that's running a uh, a classic Mac. That's running a classic Mac simulator under Linux on this tiny little screen that he's got. Um, weather stations. Um, this is a great example of young people doing cool stuff with the Pi. This is um, a couple of students at Westminster School in London. Um, they developed an air quality monitoring weather station, which they've called um, Air Pi. Uh, I think they've just done an Indiegogo for this, and they've just been overfunded by about 400%. Um, the idea is they're going to try and deploy these things. They're going to try and deploy these things all over the world. They're going to try and deploy them in cities in Africa, in particular. Um, Art. It's another community of people who we didn't realize were going to use the Pi. This is just up the road in Canada Water. This is uh, one of the docks uh, on the side of the on the side of the Thames. And these are these little plastic. They're little kind of paper boats made out of plastic uh, that all light up, and you text them from the train. So again, an example of I guess connecting the physical world to the network using a Raspberry Pi. Um, this is one we do a lot of. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you uh, saw, have seen any of our high altitude balloonning footage. Um, this is a uh, this is a big balloon full of hydrogen, um, and the thing that um, my friend Dave is holding in his hand there um, is a uh, is a contraption with a couple of Raspberry Pis in and some cameras, um, and he's going to send that up to 40 kilometers. That's a view. That's a close up view of what Dave is holding in his hand. Uh, this is Babbage the Bear. Um, on a, an ultimately unsuccessful mission to beat Felix Baumgartner's um, 38.9, and importantly, 38.9 kilometer jump. Um, this one was ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, this was um, on Bank Holiday Saturday. Let's see if we can push this across here. Um, unfortunately, on that occasion, I think Babbage decided he wasn't going to step off the capsule. Uh, we recovered from a, him from a field still desperately clinging onto his launch capsule. Uh, so we sent him up again two days later. He didn't get away with it. Where are we? And this time, we gave him a harder kick to get him off the platform. So um, uh, that, that, triggered at, uh, that was GPS triggered at 39 kilometers. So we beat, uh, we beat Felix Baumgartner by, uh, I, think, uh, I think, a total of 31 meters. Uh, there was a lot of noise in the Austrian press about this. Uh, there were a number of people in the Austrian press who suggested that, it was a, uh, that this was a fake, 
I think there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of sour grapes there. So we've uh, we've in, we've ended up inviting a couple of Austrian journalists along if they'd like to maybe come and uh, come and see our next uh, see our next bear drop. So that's a uh, that's a cute one. What else have we got? Let's close that one down. That's another shot. That's another one of Dave's shots. Um, for those of you in the UK, that's Cornwall. So that's Devon and Cornwall. That's Dorset and Devon and Cornwall from about 40 kilometers up looking west. Um, really very cute. He does these on a regular basis. And the wonderful thing about this for us is while we started doing Raspberry Pi in the hope that we were going to get more children interested in computer programming, uh, you know, we had a very narrow, selfish focus. What we've ended up seeing is that Platforms like Raspberry Pi are, for, are fantastic for getting children involved in all sorts of STEM subjects. They're fantastic for getting children involved in and excited about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all of those things. Um, the total budget to do one of these shots is about two or 300 pounds. So this puts the space program, this might as well be in space, right? There's, it's, it's a good hard vacuum up there. Um, it puts the space program within reach of every primary school in, uh, um, in the country. And that's kind of cool, and I, I mean, I. You know, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a 1980s space cadet, but I, I I really defy children not to be excited about science if they can have their own space program. I just I just don't believe they, that can possibly happen. Um, oh, there's space moon. Um, we um, we have a camera module, so. We spent a lot of time working on, as I said, we spent a lot of last year just working on getting Raspberry Pis available to people in significant volume. And that really stopped us from doing any peripherals of our own. One of the nice things this year is we've been able to get a, our first peripheral for the Raspberry Pi, our first first party peripheral. And that's a five megapixel, it's a five megapixel still camera that people have been using to take pictures of stuff. Um, the nice thing here, this is astrophotography using the Pi. So someone made a really nice shim for attaching the Pi camera module to a, to a really nice high quality telescope. Um, and by doing um, a process of kind of stacking, what you can do is you can take, um, you can take a lot of exposures and stack them up. Um, you can get really, really nice high quality images. So I think I had a, I think I had an example here. This may not be the most successful video, so watch, watch carefully. That's, uh, that's Saturn. Um, you know, that's a, uh, a, reason a reasonable image of Saturn taken using a Raspberry Pi. Let's go back here. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, we had a real focus on the UK. We were really mostly interested in the UK when we started doing this project. It's been a real surprise to us. About 80% of Raspberry Pis now sell outside the UK. We sell a lot of them in the United States. Um, this is a chap called Matt Richardson, who any of you have been involved in sort of maker, make, uh, maker fair type things, O'Reilly type things might know. Um, uh, he's been building Raspberry Pi projects since very, very early on. I particularly like this one as a cyclist. I particularly enjoyed this one. Um, it's a, an incredibly distracting head-up display that tells you how fast you're cycling you know, with a number that's in the, in the, in the beam of your headlamp. Um, a lot of people have been interested in Pi and Bitcoin. The Raspberry Pi is a really lousy platform for Bitcoin mining on. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the Raspberry Pi, people, people often think, you know, well, I could buy a lot of Raspberry Pis and I could put them together. Uh, and I get a really powerful, really cheap machine. Actually, the Ras Raspberry Pi is not a very good source of cheap MIPS. What it is, is it's a very cheap computer. So it's, um, if what you want is a lot of MIPS, you're better off building your machines out, building, building, you know, building your supercomputer or your Bitcoin miner out of white box. Um, uh, out of white box PCs. What it is very good at is this sort of thing, which is controlling other things. And so now that um, Bitcoins have got so hard to find that you really have to use ASICs, you really have to use USB ASICs to, uh, to mine them. A lot of people have been using Raspberry Pis as a, uh, as a control platform for these little, little dinky dongles, which cost hundreds of dollars each. Um, because we have a, f one of the interesting things about the Pi is we have a fairly um, low performance um, uh, we have a fairly low performance um, CPU, but we have a very, very high performance GPU. So we have very high performance graphics on the device. So one of the things we've been doing over the last year is to try to bring some of that high performance graphics capability to bear on, um, uh, to bear on the user experience. Um, so one of the things we've been keenest on is this thing. So 
been working with our friends at Calabra to, um, to try to get Wayland working on the Pi. Now, it turns out that Wayland, so Wayland is the, the putative next generation Linux desktop environment for a Linux desktop compositing system. Um, uh, it turns out to be an extremely good match for some of the compositing hardware that we have on the Pi. So at present, this is X11 on the Pi. I sort of feel that's a slightly, maybe a slide. I'm not sure what they did to it to make it work that badly. But certainly, you know, X11 performance on the Pi, because you're using this ARM11 processor to move every single pixel around, is not a particularly compelling experience. One of the nice things about Wayland is that Wayland allows you to offload all of your, you know, the vast majority of that kind of very quotidian composition work onto dedicated composition hardware. So here we have an example of, of broadly the same thing running. So this is exactly the same hardware but this time rendering its desktop using, um, using Wayland and Western instead of using Software X11. Um, and you see we have the nice shiny, we have the smooth window dragging, and we have the nice shiny fade out effects. Um, in a moment, I think we may have, yes, we have non-rectangular windows. And animation. More of these. And then these kind of really nice, these really nice Mac-like desktop effects, you know, these really nice, you know, what we, what, yeah, what we would like to do is we would like to make the Pi usable as a general purpose computer. We really do believe that even the current generation Pi hardware, if you do enough of this kind of hacking, is suitable as a general purpose piece, as a, as a general purpose desktop computer. And really a lot of the work we're doing, a lot of people ask us, when are you going to do a Raspberry Pi 2? And the answer is we're not going to do a Raspberry Pi 2 while we feel that we can screw more performance out of the Raspberry Pi 1 using clever software. Um, Raspberry Pi 2 is very tempting. Um, we're really reluctant. We've sold 1.5 million Pis. We're extremely reluctant to, author to orphan 1.5 million people. We don't want to abandon 1.5 million people and go chasing off after the next fast chipset. So this sort of thing is, incre is increasingly important to us. Um, I said we had a camera board. Um, people have been doing, I showed you an example of some uh, photographing some very large things with the camera board. Uh, here's an example of the opposite thing. Here's an example of someone who's um, fitted a made, a, made a mounting for connecting their Raspberry Pi camera board to a microscope. Um, people do other photography stuff with the Pi as well. This is a gigapixel camera. This is, a, this is using a DSLR and a programmable mount uh, to build a gigapixel camera using the Pi and off-the-shelf hardware. Um, I chose 1A. I chose to put 1A in Khan on, on, this, on this occasion. Um, uh, Khan Academy is a really wonderful platform. A lot of these MOOC platforms, absolutely fantastic for teaching people stuff. The problem is that they tend to rely on having a fast connection to, to a data center on the west coast of the United States to pull down your video content. A really nice thing that people have been doing in the developing world with Raspberry Pi is to uh, take some of those platforms, in particular Khan Academy, and bundle all of the video content onto a high capacity SD card, and then deliver um, uh, Khan Academy-like video content via sneaker net to Africa. You know, take these things out into a village in Africa, glue these up on a wall somewhere, and then connect cheap commodity um, Chinese tablets, Chinese Android tablets to them via Wi-Fi, and thereby uh, bypassing the lack of backhaul back to uh, back to the West, um, a wonderful but a wonderful group of people we know in uh, in the Netherlands um, came up with the idea of doing Raspberry Pi co-location. I think they were a little bit surprised when they got 2,000 Raspberry Pis uh, in the mail. Uh, I think they have now stopped doing it for free uh, after they started to burn through racks on a regular basis. You can see they can get quite high density, but even this is going to burn racks fairly fast. So. Um, uh, yeah, I think there are about 1,500 co-located Raspberry Pis at their data center at the moment. Um, yes, it'll run Minecraft. This is, another, this is another example of making it interesting to kids. If you want it to be interesting to kids, it's got to run the things that kids find interesting. Um, we have these things called Raspberry Jams. Uh, Raspberry Jams are these kind of user groups which sprung up completely independently of us. It's wonderful that they're completely independent of us because it means that we don't have to expend any time or mental energy running them. Uh, they're somewhere between a uh, sort of a self-help group and, uh, and a, a user club. Um, and yeah, these, these, have, these have cropped up all over the UK. There are, there are some overseas. There aren't maybe as many of them overseas as we would like. Um, 
but they're becoming an increasingly important part of how we support non-technical teachers in delivering education using the Pi. Um, another part of that is this thing called the Magpie. Again, a thing that's nothing to do with us. Um, I'm honest to God magazine with type-in listings. I mean, I used to type in a lot of listings really badly when I was a kid. It's an honest to God Raspberry Pi magazine with type-in listings. Um, a range of Raspberry Pi cases from the um, PDF that you can print out onto the thickest card that, you're, uh, um, that, that, that won't jam your printer. To Lego, this was designed by an 11-year-old Girl Scout called Biz. Um, you can now buy a kit for this online. Uh, and um, because we respect intellectual property rights, um, Biz gets royalties every time you buy one of these. And because she's, in, I think she's 12 now. Because she's a 12-year-old Girl Scout, she takes her royalties in Lego. So she now has more Lego than it, more Lego than me, and that's a lot of Lego. So. Um, another really lovely case made out of stack perspex called Pibo. These guys. For me, a really wonderful example of the kind of ecosystem that sprung up around the Pi. Um, uh, Paul Beach and um, Paul Beach and his colleagues, who run uh, the company that builds these, they built a um, you know a million pound um, a casing and hardware and accessories company based in Sheffield in the North of England in a year around building these cases. Um, I said we're starting to see evidence that kids are using Raspberry Pi. This is a kid called Mikey. He's off camera there. He's using Scratch on the Raspberry Pi. It's an example of the kind of pictures that we get sent by parents, proud parents who are seeing their kids learning to program. Often, as I said, engineers right now. At the moment, a lot of children in Raspberry Pis is about engineers taking the opportunity to share what they find interesting with their kids. So yeah, Mikey's dad is an engineer. Um, girls. Um, this is a project that we are just support, that we're supporting on the website at the moment to build computer labs in Afghanistan for teaching girls to program in Afghanistan. Um, and as I said, you know, we were very focused on the UK, and yet we found that Raspberry Pis are really cropping up pretty much everywhere in the world now, which is really, really satisfying for us. And personally satisfying, like everyone else, when we started building the Raspberry Pi, um, we asked ourselves, you know, we want to build some cheap hardware. Where do you build cheap hardware? We build cheap hardware in China. The really wonderful realization for us towards the end of last year was that we could build Raspberry Pi, the cheapest computer in the world. We could build it in Wales. Um, I'm Welsh, so uh, I'm, I'm half Welsh. I'm, since the last rugby, I'm fully Welsh. Um, the, um, uh, we discovered that we could build it just up the road from where I was born in Wales for the same price that we could build it in China. Um, we're employing about 50 people in Bridge End. Um, Sony, you can see here, there's a Sony logo. Uh, it's actually built for us under contract by Sony uh, in South Wales to incredible standard. So uh, I think that's all I've got. Um, cool, I ran to time. That's nice. So um, I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, I'll be around for a little bit afterwards as well. If anyone's got any questions, do you want to just pop your hands in the air? Any questions? You've got one at the back there. Hi. Um, there's a lot of mystery about the GPU and where, how far it can actually be utilized. I knew you, you'd know this question was going to come up properly that uh, with the hacker communities that are or hacker programming communities they could do a lot more by utilizing the GPU in products especially yeah. in stuff like software defined radio uh, etc yeah um, you know uh, which would be really handy and it would, it would totally empower it. and uh, and I've obviously I've seen from uh, from the office program LibreOffice, which I just started using myself actually uh, that, that, that it is running on the GPU, so I'm, mm. I'm pleased that it is actually starting to be yeah. utilized because that was the sort of maddest thing, Yeah, you know, so. Um, um, yeah, so there's a big issue, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know, there's a really big issue with um, open source, um, the status of open source um, graphics drivers for ARM-based um, products, for, for ARM-based SOCs. Um, we're kind of maybe, it's like that, you know, by x86 standards, it's like being back in the late 1990s where everything was all binary blobs, uh, all binary blobs in the kernel and, and, and horridness. Um, I think eventually that's going to get fixed. Um, we've taken some little baby steps, and that, a couple of things have happened with us. We took some baby steps. We were very lucky because of the way that our graphics drivers are architected. We have at least been able to open source everything that's on the ARM. So there is no closed source code on the ARM. Um, the downside is the reason we've been able to do that is that the ARM 
components of our graphics driver stack are extremely thin. They're basically an RPC serialization shim um, that, that talks to a, much, to a very sophisticated blob which runs on a proprietary processor inside the chip. So by open sourcing it, we haven't necessarily accomplished as much as people would have liked to, us to have done. Another, um, yeah. another thing, um, just for your information, I made our company under, after receiving a Raspberry Pi and realizing how cheap it was mm -hmm. and how educational it could be used for, um, we've started allocating 20% of our profits for our kids in India uh, to hopefully utilize the Raspberry Pi oh. from British Engineering and uh, try and make an academy during the day uh, so that you know the kids can go and learn and then at night and it will be a cyber cafe or gamer cafe or whatever. Wow. But we're still looking into the actual feasibility of it though. Wow. So it's a lot of phone calls, yeah. but thank you for the Pi. Oh, you're, 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 you're very welcome. If you do do that, then um, Liz at raspberrypi.org, there is contact details on the website. We always okay. like to hear about more of that stuff. Thanks. Sounds like fun. Cheers. Sure. Do we have any more questions for Eben? No? No more questions? Last chance? What is the future of Raspberry Pi? Uh, what's the future of Raspberry Pi? OK, so uh, sort of two answers. The future of Raspberry Pi as an organization, and the future of Raspberry Pi as a machine. Um, the future of Raspberry Pi as an organization, um, I think we got very distracted in 2012 and, 2000 and, and, and Certainly 2012, maybe a bit this year as well, simply in the effort of getting Raspberry Pis out to as many people as possible. It's just really hard to make, make one and a half million computers. Um, and then make things like the camera board and keep the software turning and all that stuff. So what that's meant is, although we're an educational charity, we haven't actually ended up doing an enormous amount of educational work ourselves. We've been very reliant on other people to do that for us. So I think a big thing for us, um, a big thing for us now, so the future for Raspberry Pi as an organization, is to try to actually do those things that we promised we were going to do. So right now, I said, you know, the Raspberry Pi is a great platform for. Um, it's a great platform for, um, if you're an engineer, it's a great platform for teaching your kids to code on. If you're a teacher who knows a load of stuff about computers, who has like a personal passion for it, it's a great platform to give to the kids in your class so they can go home and hack on it when they're not in school. So it's a great, and they can come back to you when they have trouble. Now the problem is, not everyone's parent is an engineer. My parents were engineers. Um, not every school, particularly not every state school in this country, has somebody who's really confident about programming. So the real push for us is to try, try to find ways of um, making it possible for somebody who isn't in that kind of privileged environment to, uh, um, to, to, to get a good experience out of the pie. And that's about several things. It's about producing a lot of educational support material. It's about making educational software run better on the Pi. We're spending an enormous amount of money on making Smalltalk run fast on the Pi because Scratch is written in Smalltalk. And lots and lots and lots of people who teach Computing, want to use Scratch. So we're spending a lot of money on that. Um, and then the other thing is trying to encourage user groups. So we were very lucky back at the start of the year, we got a million dollars from Google, uh, from Google UK, to buy, um, to buy Pi kits to give to kids. We were able to buy 15 or 16,000 Raspberry Pi kits to give to kids. Now, the, um, the uh, the way that we've chosen to get that out to people is via user groups. So there are all these organizations like Code Club and Coder Dojo, um, which organize little user groups, uh, which um, go and find local engineers and kind of bring them in to help run these things and help give the kids some advice. So we're really trying to support those a lot. We're doing a little bit of work to fund those and, um, and try and get them equipment. And then for Raspberry Pi as a machine, I mean, obviously, eventually, we're going to do Raspberry Pi 2, right? I mean, if we're, if we're shipping, still shipping our current Raspberry Pi in 2020, that would be a bit disappointing to me. Um, like I said in the talk, though, I think it's going to be a long time before we've mined out everything we can do, particularly because you know, the, the chip we use, so 2708, which is the chip that we use in, uh, in Raspberry Pi, uh, I was, was on the design team for it. It's a 30 square millimeter piece of silicon. Um, of that 30 square millimeters, 0.7 square mil is the arm. Right, 0.7 square mil is the CPU, right? The rest of that chip is graphics accelerator. So I think that there's this enormous amount of low, medium, and maybe even high hanging fruit that we can go and grab to, uh, and we're hoping to release a preview very soon of a lot of that stuff. You know, you saw the video there. We're hoping to release a preview really soon of really pretty crisp Wayland, really pretty crisp hardware accelerated web browsing, nice 3D in a window, all of that stuff starting to, starting to come together. So that's the, really the future, the future for the Raspberry Pi machine 
tends to look like software, tends to look like software work. And, and exactly what we were saying at the back there, trying to find ways to not just have us use the GPU to make things better, but trying to get all that. We've got 24 GFLOPs of floating point compute in the GPU. It'd be lovely to get those out to the hands of hackers for that sort of software-defined radio and all those other things. So I can ask another question. You mentioned uh, bringing uh, small talk into the Raspberry Pi. Do you, would you have any plans for Objective-C as a language um, to teach kids Ooh. to program in? Mm. Um, certainly a bad choice in C++, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, we have a, we have a company no C plus plus policy. Um, the um, so you, we support Objective C to the extent that the GCC supports Objective C. Um, we haven't actually we haven't done any we, we haven't done any work around uh, ourselves around um, uh, tutorials for for C like languages. Um, most of our tutorial work has been around Python. I mean, the Pi and Raspberry Pi is the Pi and Python misspelled. So, um, you know, a lot of our focus has been on interpreted languages and on sort of you know, dynamically typed uh, kind of interpreted languages where the Hello World program is print Hello World. Uh, so, yeah, Python. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice idea and certainly anything that can break us free of too much, uh, too much C++ is, uh, is, is, is got to be welcome. So. Any more questions? We still have some time. Hi, thank you for the talk, very, very interesting. Sure. Uh, you said that Cambridge and UK has a past in computers and computer science, IT, etc. But uh, maybe the last five years, UK government is very worried that there is a lack of uh, knowledge, uh, IT, computer mm -hmm. science, computer engineers in this country. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe the UK government is really uh, using the Raspberry Pi to teach the teachers mm. and the teachers to teach the students really to start from the nursery, element, high school, high school, university, etc. really mm. to have the knowledge in IT because it's very, very strange um, with the UK having a good past in computers and IT, now there is not a good yeah. people. For that reason, people ask me that we are not from the UK, yeah. we came here and mm. we have a job. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, it, it is a really, it is a terrible situation. I think we really benefited um, around about the time we announced Raspberry Pi two years ago. Um, Eric Schmidt turned up and gave the McTaggart lecture and basically just laid into the government. It was really handy, exact, beautiful timing. Turns up and says, you know, exactly that. You guys have a great past. You know, you're where Turing comes from. Got this amazing past in computing, and then you're, th you're just teaching kids office applications. So yeah, it, it is a real problem. I think that there is evidence the government knows there's a problem, and they are trying to change. The curriculum. I think the, the the question in my mind is exactly that: is is about teacher training, is about professional development for teachers. That you can't just change the curriculum and then start haranguing teachers and saying, you know, you got these teachers who are used to teaching ICT, which is a, a very practical, it's a useful, practical skills-based subject, but it's not computer science. And you can't just change the curriculum and then start wailing on them and saying, you know, why why aren't you teaching why aren't you teaching Java? Why aren't you teaching Python? Um, so. It's still an open question in my mind as to whether the um, as to whether the government's actually going to step up and provide the really very substantial amounts of funding, you know, because this is the problem: is that you know, changing the curriculum is kind of cheap, and you know, making a speech about how much we'd like computer programmers is kind of cheap. Um, training 50,000 teachers to deliver computer science, uh, satisfying computer science experience to kids, is really damn expensive, and we'll see. Just a quick question. What do you need us to do? How, how can we help as the as, uh, oh. Raspberry Pi community? Oh, um, what can the Raspberry Pi community do to help? Um, go and talk to kids about it. Take any opportunity you can find to talk to kids, not necessarily about the Raspberry Pi. I mean, we don't want people to go out and like, sell Raspberry Pis for us. But just, uh, I mean, I think the thing you can do that would be most useful for us as a, um, in terms of our mission, as opposed to in terms of the thing about the little computer, um, is to go and talk to kids about engineering. Go and talk to kids about programming. You know, go and make just make kids aware of how much fun it is. I mean, are you a, are you a, an engineer? Are you professional? You yeah yeah. I mean, just I think that children don't realize how that, they, that this is available to them. I know, I think a lot of children, a lot of teachers don't tell children. So other people are going to have to tell them. I think a lot of 
children don't understand. There's this amazing job, which is basically really well paid, and you get to pay with toys for, for all day, every day, your entire life, and get a pile of money for it. And it's enjoyable and rewarding and indoors in the warm. Uh, and I think if more children just knew about it, then we would, you know, that would be half the battle. Um, and if we could find a way to get girls to realize that it's not just a thing for boys, that would be great too. Had one more. Uh. Since the, long, the launch of Raspberry Pi, did you um, register an increase uh, in uh, computer science uh, registration? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And we're going to claim total credit for it. Um, now, there was, a, there was something like, a th I believe there was a 30% increase in the number of computer science applicants to Cambridge in um, the 2012 admissions round. So people who will arrive who are arriving now versus the previous year. Um, I don't think we can claim very much credit for it at all. I think to the extent, because, well, because there just weren't enough pies. In the, we certainly can't claim that people bought Raspberry Pis, learned to program on them, uh, got interested in programming, decided to go to Cambridge and read computer science. We can't, I think they've been on the market for six months and in very short supply during that time. So, but to the extent that we have had an impact, I think that, that we might be able to claim to have an impact. We could maybe say that we made a lot of noise and we did make an awful lot of noise about computing, and we made an awful lot of noise about exactly what I was saying. You know, um, We were very visible jumping up and down talking about this awesome thing that we were really enthusiastic about. Um, so maybe that helped. I mean, you know, you're talking about an increase of maybe 50 to 100 kids. And it's kind of conceivable that, um, uh, that, that we might have had that impact just through, uh, just through our enthusiasm. We did actually run a summer programming contest. And the really nice thing was that I had two age bands, an up to 13 and a 14 to 18 age band. The great thing is the guy who won the, eight, the up to 18 age band applied to my, not just to Cambridge, but to my college, to St. John's College at Cambridge that year. So that was, uh, that was nice. I'll, I'll, claim, I'll claim that one anyway. Yeah. Any more questions? No, last chance. Cool. Okay, well, thanks very much, guys. Cheers.